Good day and welcome back to the Interfaces Masterclass. I hope you found the previous video on the parallels between real life and software interfaces in object-oriented programming helpful and are now super motivated to join me for this first real example. Today I will try to make a very strong case for the use of interfaces by comparing two designs for the same system, ones with and ones without the use of interfaces. So let's hop in. The central example that I want to keep throughout this whole series is that of a home automation system. Home automation systems are very popular nowadays and serve multiple purposes. They provide convenience, contribute to saving energy and dust cost, and increase the comfort of living. Oh, and did I mention that they might just wreak havoc if your Wi-Fi password isn't safe? What a brave new world we live in. Anyways, to start the system off, I would like to design the temperature management subsystem. In order to keep the temperature in a room at the desired target, we need a few things. Some device that will provide us with the current temperature. A possibility to influence the temperature, for example a heater or an AC. And a way to provide the desired temperature by the user. After all, we require some code to connect all the devices and implement the logic to bring the room to the target temperature. We call this one the temperature controller. And the controller needs to talk to the three devices we outlined before. So let's just go ahead and come up with a simple design. We'll have a class for each device and one for the controller. The perfect temperature sensor has a public method to get the current temperature and two methods to adjust the calibration. Additionally, I added a reference to a room, which I will use for simulation purposes only. The simple target temperature provider is in fact very simple. It only provides us with the target temperature. The simple heater provides functionality to turn it on or off, adjust the heating power, turn it on for a set duration, after which it will automatically turn off, and a method to query whether it is on or off. The temperature controller holds references to each of the three devices and has one method run, which contains the logic to use the heater to achieve the target temperature knowing the current temperature. When we double check against our initial outline, we see that every entity is now modeled as a class. So far everything seems quite nice, but on second look we can identify some problems with this design. Let's pretend we would like to switch to a different sensor, e.g. the noisy temperature sensor. This change also provokes changes to the controller class. This is not desirable because the logic of the controller itself, which mainly consists of the code to regulate the room temperature, doesn't actually need to change at all. We are missing replaceable users. By the way, this design also violates the solid principles, especially the open-close principle which states that software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Let's go one step further. When someone makes changes to public methods of the sensor, heater or target temperature provider, this could impact the controller. We are missing some pattern to provide stability to the public API of our devices. Additionally, we don't communicate very clearly to other developers what the controller's job with a sensor or a heater is. Is the controller the entity to set the calibration for the sensor? Should it turn the heater on for a set duration? Or manually stay in charge via the turn on, turn off methods? We are missing abstraction. And what directly ensues is that using the device classes becomes more difficult. And we can even take this one step further should the controller even be allowed to mess with the sensor calibration. With these thoughts, we recognize that we are missing access restriction to our devices as well. Also, once we have multiple different sensors, it is our job to keep the public interface towards the temperature controller identical, such that they could be swapped if required. Of course, you could do this via tests, or just by being very diligent, but we all know this is not how it works. We are missing a fixed contract between the controller and the devices. 
And last but not least, we cannot start to implement the controller until all devices are fully implemented, because their public API is not defined yet. This will significantly hamper the development in a larger team. Again, this is due to us missing a contract between the controller and the devices. So we see, while this design was simple, it doesn't make our job as developers easy. The first implementation might be quick, but we will pay for the lack of proper design with large refactorings and an unmaintainable code base down the line. Basically, we didn't think about future developments very well. One approach to improve the design of the system is to use interfaces between the devices and the controller. I explicitly say that this is one approach, not the only one. Depending on your background, experience, the language you work with, the culture at your company, and other factors, you might come up with and favor a different design. And that's absolutely okay. Software design rarely has one correct solution. It's always a trade-off between different benefits and drawbacks. And in the end, you try to choose the design that seems to suck the least. Anyway, back to interfaces. If we take a look at this design, we can clearly see that this will split the classes into the controller on the consumer side and the devices as the providers. It's almost as if interfaces are one of the few things in software engineering that actually have a reasonable name. The individual device classes can now hide behind their respective interface. The iCurrentTemperature provider only declares one method, which allows the consumer to get the current temperature. The iTarget temperature provider is very similar, only that it declares a method to provide the target temperature. Only the iHeat provider is a bit more complicated. It can be turned on and off, allows to set the heating power and its current state can be checked. As you will surely have noticed, those are all methods that were previously implemented on the classes anyways, so we did not change the functionality at all. If we take a closer look at the temperature controller, we see that it can now hold references to the interfaces instead of the concrete classes. Using these interfaces between the controller and the devices gives us a few advantages we didn't have with the pure class approach. Because the controller is now communicating via the iCurrent temperature provider interface, we can use both temperature sensors interchangeably without touching the code of the controller class. This design enables a pattern called dependency injection, and we will talk about this much more in upcoming videos. Just take a mental note for now, as interfaces are a very common, but not the only way, to achieve dependency injection. Relating back to the purposes of interfaces as I introduced them in the first video, we have achieved replaceable users here. Let's look a bit further. The controller can now only access the methods it requires for managing the temperature. So we introduced access restriction. On top of that, the API of the interfaces convey our intent very clearly. We don't want the controller to calibrate the temperature sensor. This provided us with abstraction and simplicity of use. The interfaces represent the contract between the controller and each individual device. For example, to function as a temperature provider to the controller, you only need to be able to provide the current temperature. It doesn't matter if you are a sensor soldered to the main chip or a smart device communicating via Bluetooth. This converts the strong coupling we had before, which was to classes, to a way looser coupling via interfaces. Also, the controller can now be implemented without ever implementing any of the device classes. It's only important to have the interfaces down. This is what people mean when they say program to an interface, not an implementation. And the class is an implementation in this case. Last but not least, having the interfaces also provides more stability, as the barrier to changing the interface is much higher than changing a public method of a class. This is especially true if multiple classes already implement the same interface. What are your experiences with interfaces? Are you rather new or an experienced professional? Is there any topic you would like me to cover in this series? Leave a comment below, I will definitely respond. 
And if you've learned something so far, well, like the video and subscribe for future content. As the last step in this video, I would now like to take a look at the actual code I've written. And please don't be scared, this is in csharp.net. Why? Well, because somewhere down the line, I would like to take some comparisons between inheritance, like proper class inheritance, and using interfaces. And I just can't do that with Rust because Rust doesn't have inheritance. However, I think that number one, C-sharp is quite easy to read. And number two, it has quite a nice syntax. So why not learn it? It's OK. It's a good language. So let's start off with the iCurrentTemperature provider. This is the interface that, of course, implements this getCurrentTemperature. And below this, we have two classes, the perfect temperature sensor and the noisy temperature sensor, which both implement those. The calibration factor setting I have just stopped for now because we don't really need it. Even simpler, the target temperature provider, basically same thing in green here. The thing we can do is for now, because we don't have any device that provides the actual target temperature, so the user's choice, we just initialize the target temperature when doing the construction and we just return this one. Then we have a heater. We have the iHeat provider here. And of course, we have the simple heater that provides a maximum power of 2000 watts. And the implementation, it's nothing fancy here. Not at all. It's very, very simple. In the end, we have the temperature controller, which in the constructor takes in a reference to an I current temperature provider, an I heat provider, and an I target temperature provider, stores those as member variables. And the only method that we have here is run. In this method, we read the target temperature, we read the current temperature, do some log output, and then if the current temperature is lower than the target temperature, we do the most sophisticated heat control algorithm you could ever come up with. We just turn on the heater on 50% of its power. And otherwise, we'll turn the heater off. That's basically it. And to be honest, because heating is quite a slow process, this algorithm might not even perform that bad in reality. But of course, we could do better here. Now, before we look at the main function, let's take a quick look at this room that I've implemented in order to simulate this whole system. As a constructor argument, it takes an initial temperature. And then we have some, yeah, let's say some setup here, some hard-coded parameters that the outside temperature is 5 degrees Celsius. We have a volume of 40 cubic meters, a surface of 76 square meters to the outside environment. We have a density of air. We have the specific heat capacity of air and a thermal transmittance of 0.5 watts per square meter Kelvin, which is kind of the inverse to the thermal resistance between inside and outside. So the more insulation you have on your walls, the lower this value will be. And computing one tick does exactly one thing. It takes in the heating, then computes the heat that is lost, which is a function of the surface of the room, the thermal transmittance, and the temperature difference between inside and outside. And then it will update the air temperature inside the room by doing the net between heating input and heat lost, and divide that by the thermal inertia that the air inside the room has. If you would like to know more about this, this is heat transfer, you can learn this in every basic engineering class. And to round things off, this is our main function. In order to do simulations, we need to have some kind of parameters for it. I chose a simulation interval of 10 seconds and the number of simulation steps turned out that 70 was quite okay. Then we create our room with 20 degrees. We have our perfect temperature sensor that senses the temperature of the room. We have a heater and we have the target temperature provider, which provides a target temperature of 24 degrees. So we want to heat the room from 20 to 24. Then, of course, initiate our temperature controller with our three devices. And all we're going to do then is we'll do a simple for loop for the number of simulation steps we have. At first, we're always going to run the temperature controller, which 
turns the heater on or off based on the temperatures. And then we simulate one tick of the room. So let's just run this. And of course we get a lot of output. Let's scroll to the beginning here. We'll see we'll start at 20 degrees Celsius and we want to go to 24. We're turning the heater on and then for a very, very long time we're doing nothing. So we're changing nothing. Heater is still on. The room temperature is rising. And once we get to above the 24 degrees centigrade, we'll turn the heater off. If we drop below, we'll turn it on again. And this continues forever, basically. Now, in order to show you that I can actually change out my temperature sensors very easily, the only thing I'm going to do here is instead of the perfect temperature sensor, which is named like this because it can perfectly measure the room temperature, we'll take the noisy temperature sensor which will have a noise of plus minus one degree centigrade around the actual room temperature. And you see that was the only change I have to make. We can now compile and run this. And we get a very similar result. Of course, we will now expect the temperature to not be a perfect measurement, but it has some noise on it. And we'll see that here. But Overall, the temperature in the room seems to be rising, even though we have a lot of noise in our measurements. And of course, the noise will also influence the way we get to our steady state or to our not so steady state now, because it impacts the controller. But this is probably a better representation of reality to have a noisy temperature sensor. Of course, you can do now some filtering on that, and maybe we will do that in the future. But for now, it just seems like this is all working and our software design was very successful. I hope this example made it very clear that interfaces are a vital tool in structuring for object-oriented design, but we merely scratched the surface of their power. In future videos, we will see how to use them in composition, enable dependency injection for runtime customization, as well as testing, and why they play such a big role in the solid principles. This and much more is to come soon, but for now, let me wish you great success with your coding endeavors. See you next time, Green Tea Coding.